please, and it's my honor today to introduce our speaker, John Hamilton. John Hamilton is the W.R. Keenan Professor of German and Comparative Literature at Harvard University, and he's truly a model of scholarly productivity and interdisciplinary work in the humanities. His work is read and appreciated not only by Germanists and comparatists, but also by classicists and scholars in a range of other disciplines. His first book, Soliciting Darkness, Ender Obscurity in the Classical Tradition, appeared in 2003 with Harvard University Press. And it has been followed in rapid succession by several additional books, Music, Madness, and the Unworking of Language, Columbia University Press, 2008, Security, Politics, uh, Humanity, and the Philology of Care from Princeton University Press in 2013, and most recently, Philology of the Flesh, which appeared with the University of Chicago Press in 2018. In each of these books, Hamilton excels as a philologist, as a close reader of texts, and as a scholar with an impressive range of erudition from antiquity to the 20th century. I can't possibly do justice to the entirety of Hamilton's work, but I would like to say a few brief words about philology of the flesh, which one group reviewer has called a tour de force that delivers what are likely to become canonical readings of a wide range of wide-ranging corpus of texts and authors. Hamilton takes as his point of departure the Christian notion of the word made flesh, and the book explores in writers such as Ferdinand Ebner, Dostoevsky, Dickinson, Hamann, Nietzsche, Kafka, and Salon, how meaning is incarnated in the flesh or materiality of language and literature. In contrast to what Hamilton calls the philology of the body, which treats words as containers for a meaning that transcends them, a philology of the flesh maintains, as Hamann did, that we think in language and not merely through language. The materiality of language is therefore not a vehicle for sense, but a, mention, but a dimension of text that oversaturates or even obstructs access to meaning. In his analysis of the paradoxes and potentials of the concept of incarnation, Hamilton works deftly with biblical and theological traditions and their echoes in phenomenology and discussions of political theology. Yet philology of the flesh makes a unique claim that the idea of the word made flesh is decisive for how we read and engage with literature. And this implies a new concept of philology, not a philology of the dead letter, but a philology that gives life to texts and revives them for our present. Not a philology that seeks to provide for a seamless transmission of information, but one that interrogates the materiality of texts and attends to their linguistic difference. Reading with attention to the flesh of literature aims, as Hamilton puts it, to, quote, check the obsession with convenience and accessibility with transparency and functionality. And here, I think we can find a connection with Hamilton's current book project, entitled The Culture of Convenience. Today, we will hear a lecture that prevents, presents some key findings from this project in a reading of Albert von Chamisso's Peter Schlemiel's Wondrous Story. The title of the lecture is Limits to Convenience, Chamisso's Schlemiel as a Cautionary Tale. Please join me in welcoming John Hamilton. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you so much, Michael. That was very generous and, and kind and thoughtful. And thank you for inviting me here. I, I apologize for sitting down. I, it's never happened to me in my life before, but two weeks ago, I was suddenly in pain. I mean, I didn't fall, there was no trauma, it just happened. I ended up in the emergency room, it's some sciatica thing. And, and I'm fine sitting down, but, but standing for more than five minutes, I, I start to wince and it, it doesn't look very pretty. So I, I apologize for sitting down, I'll, I'll try to overcompensate with hand gestures or something along those lines. But um, above all, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful invitation uh, to be here. It's my first live lecture since I don't remember, right? Because everything was canceled over the last year and a half. So it's really nice to be back in a room uh, with people. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this project, which is really in its, its early stages. I'm going to um, you know, touch on the larger theme of convenience as I see it. It's a, it's a cr 
critique of technology in a certain regard and, and our current, you know, sort of um, our current culture of convenience, um, wanting things instantly, easily, uh, saving time and effort and energy. But then turning to this uh, text, um, which is perpetually interesting and perpetually relevant from the turn of into the 19th century, um, Chamiso's Peter Schlemiel, and, and try to read that as a kind of cautionary tale. Um, and not just a cautionary tale that sides with the so-called techno-pessimists, but also uh, one that uh, cautions the techno-optimists, um, that one cannot fall on either side, either for or against technology, but one is always both for and against it in very important um, and relevant ways that I think uh, this text brings out um, especially vividly. So with that said, I'll just, I'll just start a bit. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the general project before we move into a more, um, a more detailed reading. And, and the handout will be, of course, quotes that I refer to um, in due course. And in the box, this is thinking inside the box, is sort of the etymolog etymological stuff that I'll refer to throughout, um, just rather than write on the board or anything, you have it there. Um, and I'll, I'll get to each of those um, aspects again as, as it comes up. So revolutions eventually call for a cool critical assessment. After the initial heat of the moment simmers down, epoch-defining crises warrant the kind of analysis and the evaluation that ought to discern what might have been gained and what might have been lost on either side of the divide. Here, critique still operates in accordance with its etymological sense. The Greek term krisis and its Latin cognate krimen both denote judgment. Um, and in denoting judgment, evoke the border, the line, that must be drawn between two regions in order to arrive at any decision, and scheidung. So you always are drawing this line, the krimen, the krisis. Yet as the work of Immanuel Kant exemplifies, philosophical critique differs from a strictly judicial or legal adju adjudication, which of course must always distinguish innocence from guilt. Critical analysis rather draws a judgmental line without passing final judgment, exercising discriminating nuance without being corrupted by base discrimination. Critique focuses on the threshold itself, on that line. It cautiously resists the pull of either party and instead limits the promises and the threats of both claims. Rather than view things starkly in black and white, critique resides in a dialectical gray zone, potentially finding the good in the bad and the bad in the good. Kant may be accused of having been ambivalent towards the French Revolution of 1789, yet this ambivalence is not a vice, but rather a virtue of his critical position. To champion one viewpoint at the full expense of the other is to succumb to the non-critical pathology of the radicals or the reactionaries. Born into the French nobility in 1781, then banished in 1792 with his family to the German lands, Aldebert von Chamiso witnessed the effects of the revolution at first hand. Yet rather than join the complaints of the ruined aristocracy or pledge full allegiance to the victorious bourgeoisie, Chamiso resolutely remained on the fence, so to speak, setting his critical gaze on the claims of the past and the claims of the future. In 1813, during the Wars of Liberation, Chamiso, now age 32, found himself caught in the ambivalent position of a French national residing in the German countryside. And here I'll refer to the first uh, quote. Um, as he would later reflect, Ich hatte kein Vaterland mehr oder noch kein Vaterland. I, I no longer had a fatherland, or I didn't yet have a fatherland. Poised between the no longer and the not yet, he applauded the social gains afforded by the bourgeoisie, while fearing the loss of the traditional moral restrictions attributed to the ancien regime. He expressed hope that the leveling of old class structures would result in broad emancipation, that industrialization would improve the lives of Europe's population, 
Yet he was concerned that the, ex the excesses of capitalist and colonialist enterprises would introduce new forms of oppression and exploitation. That in abandoning the local farm for the factory, workers and proprietors alike would forfeit communal support and suffer profound loneliness and alienation. Accordingly, in 1813, while employed as a children's tutor and herbalist in the Brandenburg estate of Count Itzenplitz Friedland, real guy, Chamiso devoted his spare time to writing what has since become a classic of world literature, the Wundersame Geschichte, or miraculous, wondrous story of Peter Schlemiel, the young man who sold his personal shadow to the devil for an inexhaustible sack of gold. Presented as a pseudo-autobiography, Schlemiel recounts his quick rise in social class, from destitution to unimaginable wealth, all against the backdrop of a dominant and affluent bourgeoisie enthralled to consumerism, commodities, and the magic of financial solvency. Equipped with a bottomless trove of gold coins, Schlemiel far exceeds the opulence of the most ambitious entrepreneur. There are absolutely no limits to what Schlemiel can purchase and consume. And yet, in acquiring such boundless resources, his unbelievable fortune has become his grave misfortune. And here, citation two, I'll just read my English uh, translation. What help would wings be to a man bound fast in iron chains? He still has to despair, and even more terribly, I lay like Fafnir on his hoard, far from every human conversation, Zuspruch, suffering want with my gold. But I did not have a heart for it. Rather, I cursed that for the sake of which, I cursed that for the sake of which I saw myself cut off from all life. Shlemiel realizes too late that wealth is a form of bondage and liberation a form of dreadful isolation. Bereft of a physical shadow, he is shunned by society as a suspicious figure. No matter how much his prosperity might be recognized as a sign of worth, the absence of a shadow must surely demonstrate that he has consorted with an evil force. And so like Fafnir, the frightening dragon of the Wiebelungenlied, who greedily guarded his cursed gold, Schlemiel repulses anyone who draws near. Even though his sack of fortune, his Glückseckel, functions as a most expedient means for gratifying every want and wish, it leaves him desperately alone with himself. So again, what I would like to suggest is that this magical sack, this Glückseckel, represents an excessive instance of the convenient technologies that drive consumerist economies. I therefore take the story as a critique of convenience. As such, although written in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, Chamiso's novel, novella remains highly relevant for our own epoch, which flourishes in the wake of the so-called Digital Revolution. In considering this literary text as a critique, my reading permits a healthy ambivalence that resists falling to the side of the techno-optimists or the side of the techno-pessimists. It instead draws the lines that mutually limit the positions of today's revolutionaries and reactionaries, the media gurus, and the recalcitrant Luddites. In brief, it views the early 19th century text as a cautionary tale for the 21st century. Now just a few words on convenience, if I, if I may. In current usage, in English, convenience refers to how something is accomplished or acquired a tool, machine, or device, as well as a system, an institution, or a procedure is convenient when it enables users and agents to achieve desired ends easily, when the task at hand proceeds smoothly and expediently without frustrating complications or disruptions. Insofar as it promises to save time, effort, and energy, convenience has always served as a basic rationale for technology which is designed to facilitate whatever needs to be done and even perform tasks that would otherwise be impossible. 
These practical aspects dovetail with the experiential implications of convenience as pertaining to what is suitable or advantageous, what is opportune or appropriate, what is comfortable or enjoyable. With convenience, everything fits together. Everything falls wonderfully into place. So both the practical and the extended senses of convenience reflect the term's initial sense derived from the Latin verb for coming together, convenire. In classical usage, the basic sense of convenientia is just an assembly, a coming together, a meeting of individuals, and therefore a kind of agreement, a mutual agreement, since those who convene, those who enter into a covenant, harmonize as a group of like-minded participants. They all fit together, Conveni convenire. In this regard, convenientia pertains to a certain level of conformity, whereby individual viewpoints come to share a unified position or set of values. In Augustine, convenientia names the harmony that makes human arts pleasurable. By reducing dissimilarity, it produces a result that is wholesome, beautiful, and, and unified. In medieval philosophy, convenientia functions as a term of grammar and logic. For poffery, the perfect conjunction of subject and predicate. And for Bonaventura, the communicability and comparability of discrete concepts. William of Ockham defines convenience as the viable ground for abstraction, while for Aquinas, the term expresses the consonance of soul and body, potentiality and actualization. By extension in modern usage, a convenience is a device or a situation that brings intentions and goals into alignment. And this sense is retained in the modern French verb convenir, which means to be suitable, to be just right. And the noun convenance, which signifies propriety, decorum, or decency, knowing how to behave in accordance with given conventions. Thus, convenance may further refer to what one likes to do, an inclination, a preference, an activity that suits or agrees with one's disposition. Modern conveniences, of course, do not simply satisfy needs. More importantly, they overcome limitations. And I want to emphasize the fact that conveniences overcome limitations. The physical reality of space and time, as well as the limited capacities of the human mind and body, could be seen as hindering the path between our intentions and our goals. We therefore turn to technological enhancements, which are, in every sense, miraculous. They promise to make life and work ever easier, faster, and more effective, tailored to suit our lifestyles, to convene with our lifestyles, to convene with our schedules, with our personal inclinations and our preferences. The cognitive and commercial advantages of reducing or removing limits are self-evident. In heralding the elimination of inherited class constraints, the bourgeois revolution promoted social mobility and the uncensored transmission of ideas, which correlated with an industrial revolution fueled by the conveniences of deregulation, liquid assets, and international trade. No limits would stand in the way for making more and more profit. Overcoming local traditional limits to production facilitated the free circulation of commodities within a consumer-oriented surplus economy. Commodities are, of course, commodious. They furnish consumers with the means to accommodate themselves to reality. If easy is good, easier is better, and so forth. Today's digitally powered culture is but an amplification of this phenomenon. Databases and search engines far exceed the storage and retrieval of, a, in the, of an individual's limited memory. New media furnishes, uh, furnish conducive means for scientific advancement and unhindered collaboration, for sharing and disseminating thoughts and opinions, for granting entire populations equal voice in democratic conversation, for making institutional and authoritative power transparent and morally accountable. Connectivity and applications accomplish tasks with minimal frustration, 
Goods and services are broadly accessible, delivery is quick, and gratification nearly instantaneous. Although there's no lack of support for this full-fledged techno-optimism, isn't this a great time to live with all our technology? The convenience revolutions that began at the turn of the 19th century have nonetheless elicited suspicions. The techno-pessimists tend to regard innovations as deviously pharmacological, poisoning spirit, mind, and body while claiming to heal human deficiencies. And we are accustomed today to hearing how machine automation diminishes the human ability to think and intervene. Programmed algorithms and shortcuts may function as time and labor-saving devices, yet they also impede alternative ways of recognizing and responding to complex issues. Techno-pessimists never tire in pointing out how navigational systems decre decrease one's ability to comprehend local geography. You always get the same anecdote there. That's, I think it's a poor Korean family that drive into a lake um, and the father driving simply says, well, that's what the GPS told me to do. Um, and so he drove straight into the water, right? So these, these kinds of techno-pessimists, don't, don't you see you're driving into a lake? Well, the GPS told me. It happens with automation. I mean, how many of us, when, I mean, my email program, for example, underlines words that they think the program thinks is excessive or ad, they hate adverbs, right? If I write definitely, <laughs> definitely out. But you know, for the most part, I kind of go with it. Like I say, oh, maybe I don't need to write definitely. And I delete it. So like we follow automation in this way that I, I think it was United Airlines actually um, had pilots, seasoned pilots. I mean, these, these are people with 20, 30,000 hours of flight experience. And what they did, the, the trick was all the meters are fine. And yet an automated message says, you know, there's a fire in the engine. Even though it contradicted the meters, 80% of the pilots shut down the engine, right? Because they follow, or because automation, it's neutral. It's not subjective. It can't lie. So we trust automation in a way that we might not even trust our best friend because friends lie to us all the time, right? So it's like this weird, the convenience starts to take over things. This is what the techno-pessimists are basically complaining about, right? And, and pedagogically, right? Yeah, there are great online tools for translation, but where, when are the kids going to have that you know, hard, laborious absorption with foreign languages, right? These, this meaningful experience of just memorizing things and, 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 and learning things by heart. Because only when we learn things by heart do they touch our heart. If everything's so simple and so easy, we, we're missing out. The gratification of hard work, prolonged concentration evaporates as users exhibit little, to little tolerance for holdups and complications. People are a lot more short-fused these days, right? Why isn't the Uber car here yet? Where is it? I've been waiting 30 seconds. Where is it? That sort of thing, right? Pessimists point out, technological convenience may well save us time and effort, yet for what purpose are we saving all this time and effort? Okay, lots, we, we've saved a lot of time, now what do we do with it? So I don't need to go on with this, right? I mean, basically, um, you get the idea. And, and you know, it just increases, right? Convenience and capitalism, they, they go together very well because when you overcome any limit, all you really do is establish a fresh limit. It's like a sports record, right? You just set a new bar to be met. You surpass the, the one barrier only to set a new barrier, right? If someone runs you know, the one minute mile, well, you're just basically waiting for someone to do it in 59 seconds and then 58 seconds. Do, do people do a mile in a minute? I'm not, no, two minutes, right? Four. Four, if you do the mile in four minutes, thank you. If you do the quarter mile in one minute, How's that? Quarter mile in one minute. But you know, you get the idea. Which this makes sense for capitalism, right? Because you, never, you can never buy your last iPhone because there's always going to be a new one, right? And you have to somehow um, not, not use things, right? It's not like things are being used, gebraucht. They have to be used up, verbraucht, so you can buy another one to use. And, and so the engine continues. Techno-pessimists will really go far with this, right? They go so far to depict these horrific dystopian visions that are really disturbing. Right? Um, in addition to the problematic conversion of the consumer into an unwitting product, 
whereby our personal data is mined and marketed, advanced technology, technologies seem to threaten the annihilation of human being itself. Right? Nanotechnology and genetics, robotics and artificial intelligence. They hold out a future where we can be conveniently liberated from our limitations as human beings, where we might even attain some kind of divine transcendence and immortality. Yet, of course, who would be the beneficiary of this great technological rapture? Right? We won't even be around any longer when we surpass all our human limits. There is one way to surpass all our human limits, right? And we know where that road leads. We may possess the means for conquering spatial and temporal limitations, yet at least for the present, our all too human bodies, I know this very well, continue to exist in space and time with a moving sun behind our backs, casting shadows on the ground before our feet, at least until the final nightfall. So, in exploring the consequences of trading one's shadow for unlimited resources, Peter Schlemiel's miraculous story comprises this critique. As the title already proclaims, the tale is miraculous, or wundersam, an adventure that entails a supernatural intervention in everyday life something that transgresses natural limitations and cannot be explained by natural laws. A magical sack that provides an endless supply of gold constitutes a most convenient technology insofar as it allows Schlemiel to acquire whatever he desires without restriction, just as the story itself, soberly recounted, readily oversteps the limits or the conditions of reality as we know it. The theme of convenience is underscored from the very beginning of the narrative. Initially an indigent young man of no means, Schlemiel has come to possess a recommendation letter that will grant him easy access to the home of a wealthy entrepreneur, Thomas John. Like an efficient machine, all the pieces are in place for Schlemiel to embark on a lucrative career. The path to success has been cleared and everything could come together, should come together smoothly. The only problem, however, is that Schlemiel cannot fit in. His very being represents a wrench in the works. His name already is an awkward collision of two components that don't suit each other. If, if, if convenire means the perfect coming together of two components, Schlemiel is already a mismatch. Well, you have the Christian name Peter, doesn't quite align with the very Yiddish sounding Schlemiel, which already is a common noun in the 19th century that describes someone who is unfortunate, clumsy, and repeatedly inconvenienced. But in fact, the term Schlemiel, as some of you probably know, it's a compound, right? It's the German Schlimm, right? bad, sinister, and Mazel, Hebrew Mazel, which is kind of good luck or fortune. So you have this combination of, of bad and good in Schlimm Mazel, Schlemiel. Schlimm Mazel becomes Schlemiel in common usage. So you have this Christian and Yiddish, German and Hebrew parts, Peter Schlemiel, the name already forebodes some serious malfunctioning. What everyone else regards as fortunate and favorable, the Schlimm Mazel finds to be unfortunate and unfavorable. And this, this problem is explicitly pronounced in the opening uh, sentence of the novella, which I've given you as, as citation number three. Right? After a fortunate, glücklichen, yet for me, very troublesome, beschwerlichen sea journey, we finally reached harbor. So everyone, everyone sees this as glücklich. Right? This was a very fortunate sea journey, but not for Schlemiel. Schlemiel is unique in finding it burdensome, right? or finding it a heavy burden from his unique perspective. So already, right, the, the, it's a foreshadowing of the main theme of the plot, right? Although the limitless supply of gold will be identified as a Glückseckel, a, a purse of fortune, it will become a, a, an, an onerous device for its bungling misfit possessor. As Shemiso later explained to his brother Hippolyte, quote, a, I don't have this on your handout, sorry. Um, a schlemiel breaks his finger in his vest pocket. 
He falls on his back and breaks his nose. He always comes at the wrong time, to Unzeit. Peter Schlemiel, end quote, Peter Schlemiel is nearly a personification of inopportuneness. Whereas convenience denotes that smooth coming together, Schlemiel always comes across as a misfit, mismatching and malfunctioning. Even later in the year of his death, um, for the preface that he prepared for the French edition of the novella, Chamiso uh, depicts the protagonist as someone who lives his life, quote, without regard for societal conventions, convenance. Right? So the, 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 to live in the world and operate it, in it successfully is to go along with the conventional wisdom, and Chamiso is unconventional. He's inconvenienced or somehow personifying the lack of convenience. Particularly telling, I think, is the opening episode, which describes a garden party at the home of Thomas John, right? This is Schlemiel's would-be benefactor. The scene vividly illustrates Schlemiel's unsuitability in the reigning culture of convenience. The estate, which sits beyond Hamburg's north gate, is clearly coded as bourgeois or nouveau riche, the, quote, large new house of red and white marble with many columns. That reflects the ostentatious taste of the entrepreneurial proprietor, right? The bourgeoisie who wants to show everyone how successful, how wealthy he in fact is. Another few columns, please, right? We want this to be visible from the town. And Schlemiel has a recommendation letter, right? It gains him entrance. It works like a charm. He's shabbily dressed. He doesn't have any money, and yet he gains access to the site as if he had a password to get into this party. But Thomas John, being who he is, is too busy to entertain, and so the new arrival receives little more than a brusque welcome, which then leaves Schlemiel to wander around freely along the grounds, right? But, and, and thinking to himself, I really don't fit in with this crowd. He's ignored by the other guests. The other guests would agree, you don't belong here because they're as fabulous as they are vain. He's a fish out of water and he marvels at the party's glibness in a way that I think is, is quite remarkable. It, it sounds a lot like how today's cultural critics write. I mean, I have this as citation for, um, the company was very cheerful, aufgeräumt. There was flirting and joking now and then, one spoke about frivolous things seriously and serious things frivolously, and in particular, quips about absent friends and their affairs flowed comfortably, gemächlich. Almost want to translate gemächlich as conveniently there, right? So it's so easy when your friends aren't around to quip about them. Um, say there was some program where you could write um, remarks and be anonymous and not have to face your friend um, in person, and you could say whatever you want, right? <laughs> I mean, with concision, I think, Shimizo portrays the convenience of these convening guests. They sense no limits. They're cheery, or they're even tidy, aufgeräumt, as if, as if you know, everything has been cleared for them. And so the gossip is facilitated by the absence of friends whose presence would hinder their comments. It, it all makes the scene very gemächlich, I think, right? Comfortable, leisurely, easygoing, and so forth. But the culture of convenience really comes into prominence as attention centers on one of the guests, Fanny, an attractive young woman designated as the lady of the day, who is seen admiring the brilliant roses in the garden. While plucking one of the blossoms, she pricks herself on a thorn, and a gallant bystander, appalled by the sight of blood, immediately calls out for an English plaster. Out of nowhere, a servant appears. Paradoxically, he is conspicuously described by a long list of inconspicuous adjectives. Shemiso's genius here is lovely. He, he, he describes this servant as ein stiller, dünner, hagrer, länglicher, etlicher Mann. A quiet, thin, gaunt, longish, elderly man. And he's kind of like a dubious middleman. The gray servant stands out by not standing out. So he reaches into the pocket of his coat and humbly produces immediately the plaster, the desired item. 
And Shlemiel notes that the injured lady takes the bandage without a word of acknowledgement or thanks. She's clearly the kind of person who expects to receive at once whatever she wants. Undeterred by the incident, the guests walk up the hill for a splendid view of the sea. The host, Thomas John, notices, quote, a luminous point on the horizon between the dark waters and the blue sky. He immediately calls for a telescope. With another obsequious bow, the man in gray pulls from his coat a brand new state-of-the-art Doland telescope. Where this commodity came from and how it was delivered are of no concern. The scope of the wealthy man's needs and desires is as limitless as the open sea and the wide heavens which stretch out before him. The telescope, of course, likewise overcomes limits. Providing Herr John with the technological means for peering farther than the naked eye. In training this convenience on the coast, he recognizes the speck of light that he noticed as a ship. In fact, the very ship that should have left harbor the day before, but was held back by an adverse wind, Biedrige Wind. As an industrious businessman, Herr John is well aware of the scheduled arrivals and departures in two ports, which represent the colonial expansionism and lucrative trade that made Hamburg a prosperous merchant city. The seafaring technology, the ships, constitute a most convenient means for monetary accumulation. It sails into the natural vastness, overcomes geographical distance, and thereby allows fortunes to come into the city's um, banks, into the city's pockets. And yet the vessel, though, remains poignantly limited vis-a-vis -vis the limitless nature it has to confront. That wonderful detail that Shemiso provides. The ship would have set sail yesterday, but was held back by an adverse wind. Despite the magnitude of one's financial and material resources, human aspirations are still limited by nature. The ship could not leave the day before. The wind was too heavy. The technologies devised by engineers can accomplish many things, but they can't accomplish everything. They can't accomplish everything. Nonetheless, going back now to the scene, the curious servants in gray who magically produced the brand new telescope from his pocket, does lead everyone to believe that everything is possible. When several members of the party express their wish to rest comfortably on the damp slope, the complacent servant draws out of his pocket a 20 foot long Turkish carpet embroidered with gold thread, right out of his pocket. At no point do the guests appreciate the capacity of this accommodating steward to provide so easily whatever they wish. Not even when he furnishes them with the material, hardware, and tools to erect a giant tent for 30 guests, right out of his pocket. Nor when he produces out of his gray pocket three beautiful horses equipped with saddles and harnesses. And no one, to, everyone takes this as a matter of course. Everyone takes the delivery of this merchandise as perfectly natural. For them, these accomplishments are nothing out of the ordinary, nothing particularly miraculous. They utterly ignore the servant's resourcefulness. No one knew how these costly new objects came to him. That's a quote. The verb is zu kommen, literally coming to someone, but zu kommen has that figurative sense of befitting someone. Right? Hence, in the Grimm's historical dictionary, zu kommen is the synonym they give for the Latin convenire. Convenient is that which arrives, convenit zukommt, in a manner that is favorably befitting, convenient zukommend. The nominal form of zukommend is zukunft, of course, the common word for the future, the time that is to come, l'avenir. And for the prosperous guests at the party, the future is bright, more time to fulfill their wants and desires, a future as rosy as Thomas John's rose garden. The force of the verb venire, to come, is evident throughout. The guest, sense, the guest sense of convenience presumes that whatever adventure, whatever adventum may greet them, whatever event or eventum may occur, they have the means to succeed effortlessly. 
Yet Shlemiel, who neither fits in nor finds his circumstances befitting, views what is to come as a very bleak prospect. He sees that there must be some evil magic at work with this servant. He stares at the man in gray. And in staring at this man in gray, he too begins to feel gray or queasy, growly. How could any human servant be capable of producing such a hoard of goods from a simple coat? And why is it that no one seems to expect anything less? Above all, Shlemiel is bothered by the fact that he is the only person who appears to notice this fantastic creature. While the well-heeled guests blithely expect nothing less than the immediate delivery of the commodities they desire, the destitute Shlemiel quivers with uneasy wonder. And yet, in feeling queasy, by being in a gray mood, graulich, he is already drawing closer to the man in gray. Shlemiel, who alone was fascinated by the limit, limitless means of the devil's deep pockets, rashly agrees to sell his shadow in exchange for the legendary sack of Fortunatus. The once poverty-stricken man will have the convenience of infinite purchasing power at his fingertips. The uncanny servant, I mean, it's just remarkable. It personifies technological convenience. Able to procure whatever, des whatever items we desire with unbelievable speed and without any hassles, right? And we all live in this world, of course. His services are not simply gratifying, but also function in a way that is emphatically convenient, saving the guests time, effort, and energy. He delivers at their doorstep an entire range of goods of increasing grandeur, all produced from a sleek gray pocket as if out of thin air. And no one is surprised by these wondrous feats. In fact, from the guest's perspective, the servant hardly seems to exist. Thin and gray, the devil in the Mac could well stand in for, well, today's iMac. Right? Thin and gray, an almost transparent medium that enables users to order practically everything they need or want delivered to the front door with little to no effort. And we know such convenience will have to come at a cost. Like Peter Schlemiel, who is persuaded to surrender his shadow to this eminence grise, today's digital consumers freely give away their privacy, unwittingly selling off what should argui arguably remain in the shadows. For the sake of convenience, how many of our lives are compromised by means of a thin gray device whose active formative role often remains unacknowledged? Exchanging one's private shadow for a miraculous, limitless convenience would seem to be a particularly fitting deal. As the present absence of light, a shadow represents a lack or want. It's the lack of light. Therefore, in losing his shadow, Schlemiel loses lack itself. With the buying power to purchase whatever he desires, he knows no want. He suffers no minus. Yet, as he soon learns, a man without a shadow has no place in human society. Despite his lavish generosity, despite being mistaken for a mysterious count, he is incapable of sustaining any relationship. His marriage proposal to the beautiful Mina, prudently made after nightfall, ends bitterly. For the sun invariably rises, exposing the shadowlessness that scares his beloved off. The ultra-convenient sack of gold thus becomes an inconvenient burden. Again, what others would take to be great fortune for him is a cause of serious misfortune. Schlemiel, the exemplary misfit. He could have whatever he wants, whatever he wishes, but he can't have his shadow. With desperation, he strives to win back the possibility of lack. Shamil's predicament, of course, makes perfect economic sense. Although markets aim to satisfy wants, the elimination of all wants forever would cause the entire system, obviously, to collapse. In any system based on exchange, it is scarcity that determines value. And since Shlemiel can no longer suffer from scarcity, his possessions lose their value. With inflationary logic, his limitless store of gold renders the once precious metal valueless. In, eight, in the 1838 preface, I referred to this already, to the French translation of his novella, 
Shemiso confessed that he had no idea what the shadow meant. The question whether the author was being sincere or not is of little consequence because this ignorance, I think, is perfectly appropriate. If a shadow is the absence of light, if it's a nothing, how can you explain nothing? What Shemiso does instead, he cites from the Abbe Aoui's elementary treatise of metaphysics from 1803, and I have that for you in quote five. An opaque body can only ever be lit in part by a luminous body. And the space deprived of light, which is situated on the unlit part, is what one calls shadow. Thus, the shadow, strictly speaking, represents a solid whose form depends at once on the form of the luminous body, on the form of the opaque body, and on the position of the latter with regard to the luminous body. I just love these very wonderfully clarifying paragraphs. Is that clear? You got that? I mean, it's a little confusing. But basically, the production of a shadow, as we know, involves an illumination, but an illumination that is partial and positional. Two aspects that underscore corporeal limitation. Physical earthbound existence is contingent on spatial coordinates. Always bound to a position, a body may be situated in many places, but it's always situated. It's always somewhere, somewhere that's defined and bounded, never infinite, never boundless. That's why Shemiso glosses this excerpt. And the following is Shemiso's comments on this passage, uh, citation six. It is therefore this solid which is in question in the marvelous history of Peter Schlemiel. The science of finance teaches us enough about the importance of money, that of the shadow is less generally recognized. My imprudent friends coveted money whose price he knew, and he did not think of the solid. The lesson he has paid dearly for, he wants us to benefit from it, and his experience cries out to us, think of the solid. Songez au solide. Schlemiel, the fictive autobiographer, offers his cautionary tale so that his readers may not fail to value the solid bodies of lived experience. That one always recalls the partialness and the positioning that del delimit the seemingly infinite power of wealth. The comment appears to say, when we value convenience above all else, when we covet the ability to acquire and accomplish everything with minimal time and effort, we risk treating corporeal existence, our own existence, less as a fact of life and more as a problem to be solved. We approach the unsustainable view that our very lives, insofar as they are deficient and complicated, earthbound and limited, are somehow unwanted difficulties that we should get rid of. Thankfully, Schlemiel resisted that final temptation. When the man in gray offered to return his shadow in exchange for Schlemiel's soul, the hero did recall the solid. He rebuffed the devil and hurled the inconveniently convenient purse off a cliff. But that's not the end of the story. Schlemiel rejects the magical bag and its limitless capacities, but he does not renounce all technological convenience. Rather, he will continue to use and enjoy technology, but now in a limited fashion. In this way, I think, Shemiso engages the critical force of the threshold. He doesn't fall to the side of sheer techno-pessimism, technology is really bad, but he doesn't embrace the gospel of techno-optimism. No, he's, he's in this moderate position, right? Neither black nor white, but gray. Almost finished. Thank you for your patience. Unburdened of the accursed purse, with the few coins left in his pocket, Shamil makes one last purchase. He can't afford new boots, so he buys a pair of used boots, which turn out to be seven league boots, entirely by chance. Another magical technology that will enable the user to stride seven miles at a pace. This transportation marvel is certainly a convenient means for traveling the world, yet, Unlike the sack of fortune, it's not limitless. The boots can take Schlemiel to many places, but not everywhere. In thinking of the solid, he has learned to value the limitations that make life meaningful. He even acquires the supplemental technology of Hemshua, 
braking shoes or something like that, which he straps onto his boots so that he can decelerate his steps and devote his time to his new chosen field of study, botany. He's going to study plant life, botany. As we would expect, the devil in gray doesn't go away. He still has his shadow. He still has a bargaining tool. And he haunts Shlemiel. But now he's going to haunt him with a new temptation. This is uh, citation number seven. He, the man in gray, expounded his views of life and the world, and very soon came to metaphysics, regarding which the demand was made to discover the word that would be the solution to all riddles. He set out the task with much clarity and proceeded to answer it. The key to solving every mystery, all the world's mysteries, corresponds, of course, to the single magical purse that once promised to solve all financial difficulties. The devil's fresh offer resembles Leibniz's notorious solution to the problem of evil. Leibniz had one word to solve this major problem. The solution lies in reconciling our faith in the goodness of God and his creation with the fact of evil in the world, both man-made and natural. And Leibniz calls the solution the principium convenientiae, the principle of convenience. It insists that God's plan, although inscrutable, ultimately matches or agrees with, suits or befits human prosperity, that we are living in the best of all possible worlds. Everyone knows that. But Shlemiel will have none of it, right? Shlemiel's like, like Candide, Voltaire's Candide. He's going to cultivate his garden instead. He's going to study botany. As the empirical study of physical reality, botany produces knowledge without aspiring to infinite metaphysical heights. Shlemiel no longer has any taste for limitless power. He, he yells at the devil, I have abstained from trying to know and comprehend everything. Shlemiel does not renounce the pursuit of knowledge. He renounces the hubristic ambition to know everything. The study of the world's plant life is an endless occupation, but it can never culminate in complete totality. Thus, Shlemiel enjoys and celebrates technology to achieve miraculous things, but not all things. He could stride at seven miles apace, but no further. So towards the story's end, Shamil learns that the small fortune which he left behind before going off to travel the world has been used by his former servant and his former fiance to build a philanthropic hospital for the indigent. The institution is appropriately named the Schlemilium in honor of its benefactor. Despite the gold's evil source, it can be converted to a good cause. The dark evil can have a bright future when it functions within the natural limits that motivate and enhance human mortal life. What is to come, die Zukunft, l'avenir, may be good or bad, opportune or inopportune, bearing fortune or misfortune, convening with one's conventional beliefs or not. That is to say, convenience is neither black nor white, but as gray as the prudent technician, as gray as the ambivalence of any technology which, in order to overcome limits, requires that limits remain in place. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry it was so long. I really I hate giving long papers, but thank you. <laughs> I, 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 it's a small group. I could do it. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. The, uh, the pocket in his coat is also a particular kind of pocket, which is hidden in the tail, yeah. in the tail coat, right. and was meant to uh, hide certain mm -hmm. necessities. Right. I picture used handkerchiefs or something. <laughs> uh, in any case, it was a fashionable. Out, uh, it's a great time. detail. Right, but who, who would think you would have three horses in there? Right, <laughs> but it, it was meant to hide right. uh, crude realities. Nice. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. When it was, uh, became a fashionable kind of coat pocket. 
Right, and, and of course in, in England, in English usage, in England, um, convenience in the 19th century generally means um, a toilet. Yes. Right? It's, it's to, I mean, convenience often functions as a way to you know, get, get rid of things we'd rather not deal with, like the convenient food. Like we need to eat, but I'd rather not spend time making food. I need to finish this paper. I'm giving a talk in Dartmouth, right? So you know, we, 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 we like our conveniences to take care of these, these sort of corporeal tasks um, you know, flush them away, so to speak, but, right, but so that we could do more important things, um, things not, not labor, but rather work in that Arentian sense. So that's a great detail. Thank you so much for that. Hey, is, the, is the word a Schultzkasche or? Is that, is that what? Yeah. The yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, that's it's a great, great detail. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, it's, it's a more simple question, but um, this concerns the preface that Chamisa wrote in 1938. 18, yeah. Uh, 1838, when he talks about the solid, and um, mm. it, it's it's striking. You know, he talks about the importance of money, and then um, what we do not think about is the solid. But he, that he would use the shadow, which is something ephemeral and you know, not really. Um, you can see it when it when it's being cast, but it's, you can't touch it. Right. So he, that he would think of that as a solid. And, and I think in your glossing of mm. the phrase, you translated as the solid stands for the lived experience. Right. But um, it, what is the connection to the shadow there? I, 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 maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I, I believe Shamiso is referring to the solid as the body that casts the shadow. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So, so don't forget, mm-hmm. don't forget the shadow. Uh, I'm sorry, don't forget the solid means that we are always in a position, right? We always occupy a spatial temporal position at any point. Um, and to ignore that, to think that we could, I mean, this is sort of also, you know, when, when we achieve, say, in, in this enlightenment idea of progress, and we, re- we reach this zenith, uh, right? It's when the sun is overhead, when we have the least shadow. We feel right. so limitless. Mm-hmm. And as the sun starts to set, as we get weaker in our old age and start you know, getting sciatica and stuff like that, you know, our, our shadows get longer and longer. They're more of a burden. But think of the soul that we, we are always limited in some way. Um, and to, to imagine some kind of shadowlessness is basically inhuman or, or unhuman. I think first here, and then we'll go back. I'm sorry, and I, I know where I met you outside. If you I'm Jamie. Jamie, thanks. Thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to offer two comments. One is a little more serious than the other. Um, one is that I couldn't help but think that in the midst of your discussion of our contemporary god of convenience, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> yeah, of uh, who also is our contemporary meal, right? Because yeah. he's a man who does not have a shadow. Right. <laughs> who despises so much the earthbound. <laughs> must escape right. to space as quickly as possible. Uh, and, 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 and his, his man in gray, uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and in competition with a few other uh, potential schlemiels. Uh, but uh, Bezos, uh, even more so because yeah. of Amazon, of course, is the yeah. the apotheosis of... And you could, I could probably get three horses delivered here. If, if, I mean, if, right? I had, if I had the cat, if I had the, the bank account, I probably could have it. I mean, just we're, we're used to you this sort of thing. You should pitch your book to Bezos, so he'll send you to space. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but the, the slightly less serious question <laughs> is, uh, 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 I, I noticed that the there's a kind of logic of bad infinity that structures the uh, argument you're making that I think is quite interesting because um, sometimes this logic of that infinity mm. is thought of in terms, you said at one point, it's the infinite resource, he has infinite resources in the story, infinite resources, but human aspirations are limited. Mm. But I've often heard the contrary version, which is that there's like an infinite uh, aspiration in capitalism, right. but limited resources, and this is where the environmental critique would come so in. If I said that, I misspoke, because I... I, I apologize. I might have written that. I might have made a mistake because I, I would agree with you there. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. But I, but actually, I think both are right. Both are the same. It, it's a, I think that this idea that the the collapsing of space mm-hmm. uh, it, and the shortest shadow or the lack of a shadow mm-hmm. um, is a, an expression of both sides of that formulation. Infinite means which tilts toward the end inexorably. Mm-hmm. 
uh, on the one hand, and then an infinite end that tilts toward the exhaustion of means. Mm -hmm. To play up the logic of the means and the end. Right. Um, so I found that very, very uh, evocative in there in your presentation about this uh, idea of the means and the end, right. and in the story too. So. Yeah, it's also interesting that you bring the bad infinity because I always take bad infinity to be essentially a logic of, of addition, of this additive. You just keep one more adding. Um, like information, you never really get to the end of information. Right? You just get another piece of information, it just keeps going. It's additive as opposed to a kind of narrative version of infinity, which would have a beginning, middle, and end, right? Because it's a narrative. And, and what, what Convenience certainly seems to be operating along this logic of bad infinity in this additive sense. So I, I, I fully agree. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, it's 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 interesting that um, that we that that, that, that the, the neoliberal idea behind this is just it just matches so well with this. I mean, this culture of convenience is what we've been looking for essentially all, all along because it, it just feeds this almost on a structural level already. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yes. I just had a question. Do you, uh, the term when the, when Schlemiel goes to the painter mm -hmm. and, oh, asks, what were <laughs> and, and the painter asks him, uses the term, I, it was it Einhaltungsschatten? Schlagschatten. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's, it's very funny. And which turns out to be a, a painterly term. Right. But yeah. Of course, it, and he says, "No, a fine show shot." So, I, I, that to me feeds into the notion of the, the luminous and the solid. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and, and you you may know, right, that in, in ancient Greek, the, the word for painting is skiagraphia. Right? It means tracing a shadow, because mm -hmm. you know, alluding to the, the the idea that the first paintings were when someone casts a shadow on the wall and you traced it of, a, of say, a loved one before the loved one goes off to Troy and you have a, 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 a sort of a tracing to, uh, to memorialize. So that's, but the common, in, in when painting is just painting in fifth century Athens, it's skiagraphia still. It's, so it's course, like, silhouettes and... Yeah, silhouettes too and, and so forth. So you have, you have this sort of shadowiness and the fact that paintings are two-dimensional like shadows. So we take a, it's a depiction of three-dimensional reality flattened into two dimensions. So it already has a shadowy um, aspect and shadow plays and, and so forth. But yeah, I, I love that scene with the, like, you think you could paint a shadow for me? Like, <laughs> it's remarkable. It, it, the humor uh, reminds me always of um, the, uh, the Peau de Chagrin by Balzac because, you know, Raphael has to go through the same kind of, he gets all these artists and scientists to help him you know, prevent the skin from shrinking, because when the skin shrinks to nothing, he dies, right? So it, it, it satisfies every wish again, and the Peau de Chagrin is, a, is sort of a, a complementary story to this, um, 1831, so after Chamil, of course, but it has that same logic and same energy that motivates it. Uh, I think Klaus first, and then, yeah. Yeah, I, um, thanks, that was a great talk. One, um, question I had uh, was with respect to the uh, technology of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, when you look at Kitler's essay on, on, on Camiso, it is, you know, thinking through this paradigm mm -hmm. of 1800 of writing, conjuring up ghosts that, uh, right. um, that come with the productions of absences that happen in the, in the hallucination through the process of writing. And mm -hmm. I wonder how, um, how you um, move through this, because I mean, this is also an epistolary no um, novella, mm -hmm. in some sense. And um, there are scenes like, for example, when the, um, the postmaster, the, the father of Mina, Mina. Uh, confronts him, says, you have no shadow. He says, there's this fantastic scene, which, which is very interesting with the question of language and writing, where he says, the, the shadow is not nothing, I'm talking, uh, uh, um, the, uh, this, the shadow is nothing, basically, that uh, one shouldn't be worried about. Uh, it's not even worth the effort, effort and noise that you're producing here. And then he says, but um, in the mode of 
talking about this, I already noticed the ungrund of what I'm just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I could uh, lose, my shadow, I could also add and find again. Right. And I think that's, that's actually a profound comment on language and mm -hmm. writing as well. And I wondered if you could somehow connect this or with a question of convenience. Um, as both mm -hmm. kind of an assembly of what is becoming, but also what is what is unbecoming. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there is the contract. The contract. He cannot. He's belaboring the question of the yeah. contract. He mm -hmm. says, "I cannot sign this this uh, setting." Um, right. There's this interschrift that he just is dreading to give. Right. Um, so I wonder about this. Uh, with respect to the philology of, of the shadow, so to say. Yeah, I would have to think further. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought you were going to bring up the scene, the 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 dream where right. he, right. where the where he sees Shamiso uh, reading books of botany, oh, but but Shamiso is dead. Yeah. Right. So the so the author is de the author of this note exactly. of the pseudo autobiography is dead. So that, that would that would seem to be more in line with what Kittler is driving at. With the relationship of the production of absence, um, or that that writing is, in a sense, a, a monumentum, right? That it is it, you know, exegi monumentum. You know, I I've, I've constructed a, a tombstone, basically. That, that the writing is the death of the author. Non non omnis moriar. This is Horace, uh, at last ode of book three, three thirty. I, I shall not die entirely because I'm I'll, I'll die somewhat because. You know, my my work will will supplant me. So mm -hmm. that that seems to be a convenience. Um, how I would read it as a convenient means for for posthumous survival or, or or a means of survival in that way. But getting down to these other parts with the contract, especially, um, you know, contract would would seem to to rhyme with the with the semantics of of convenire because it's a coming together. A meeting of you know a meeting of parties, a, an agreement. I mean, a convenientia is an agreement, so it could be a, a signed agreement. So it seems to make a lot of sense. Um, but the fact that Shamil is you know in a sense the personification of, of non convenience or non fitting in cannot sell. Um, he learns that Thomas John has sold his soul. Mm -hmm. That's why Thomas John has a shadow now, but he has no, his soul will be eternally damned. Um, Shamil can't take that, that last step. At, at, the very, at the very last moment, he, he remembers the solid, so to speak, and, and will not give himself over to this, this devil's bargain. He's kind of the anti-Faust, in a way, right? Because Faust you know, never wants to stop striving, and you know, he has to kind of get, the, the, you know, get rid of the means that will satisfy everyone. So he, but you know, there's also that magical convenience in Faust. I mean, my favorite scene, I think, would in this regard would be the uh, witch's kitchen, uh, where you know, Faust, very embarrassed by all the mumbo jumbo and the you know, alligator tails in jars, he's embarrassed by all this stuff and you know, dragon claws and he's, he looks in the mirror and, and Mephisto, as you know, says, well, you know, we need to get you looking a little younger. You take about forty years off before we go out into the world and make you, you know, a strapping young man. And he says, oh, do I have to do this magic stuff? I really, it's embarrassing. Goes, well, you know, there, you could, you know, there are other ways like dieting and exercise. All oh, right, give me the magic. <laughs> <laughs> Convenience, and, and you know, that's, but Faust is always this kind of, can never be satisfied. Um, and, 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 and I think, because Shemiso, as you know, wrote a Faust, Ein um, Versuch, he, he sort of wrote an essay on fast. So I, I, I think one would start by comparing those two as complements to each other to answer this. But I thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to have to think further on it. Mm -hmm. Heidi, right? Thank you so yeah. much for that great presentation. And I have another complimentary story. Do you know Der Streit um des Esels Schatten, Christoph Martin Wieland? No. You don't? don't. Okay. Okay. It's okay. a great story because here's the story. There's a man and he rents a donkey. 
Mm -hmm. and then it's very hot and then he wants to <laughs> rest in the shadow of the donkey and uh -huh. then the owner of the donkey says well you have to pay for the shadow you want to pay for the donkey <laughs> and then <laughs> he says well if I pay for the donkey I pay for the shadow <laughs> so they have this great dispute That's and great. then in the end they go back to the city and the whole city nearly starts a civil war because <laughs> there are big Indians and the small Indians right you know the, <laughs> the, the thing some people say, well, it belongs to the donkey, and the others say it doesn't. And of course, here the shadow is a shadow of convenience, because yeah, it helps you fantastic. against um, the sun. Whereas Schlemian's shadow, you don't need a shadow as a human being. Right. <laughs> you yeah. really don't need it. And it's just like you always want what you don't have. And you're always afraid. And I think that was mm -hmm. very interesting in that scene that you mentioned with um, with the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. It's all about showing off. They yeah. all feel inadequate. Ostentatio, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it also has like this great phrase when he says, well, I didn't know to whom to talk to, not even the servants, because they were so arrogant. Yes. And, <laughs> but then I chose the person who had a minderes Aussehen than the others. So right. he is condescending Super. here, really is putting himself right. there. Yeah. And then they talk about the um, the man in the grey coat that he looks like I'm, 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 I'm Zwirn, ein Stück Zwirn or something. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the French actor going through yeah. the, the, the teller left through the needle. Yeah, so they're just so <laughs> condescending, just yeah. focusing on appearances. Right. So. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that's important. That's, well, I will I will certainly uh, go to the Wieland. Yeah, I think that's a great. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's a great. Uh, I think it's in the Abderitten. It's excellent. The Abderitten. Okay, well, I'll certainly look for that. And and I have another question because I really noticed that he in the end when he has to see Meilenschiefe, he mm -hmm. mainly um, visits places uh, Neuholland, Lombok, basically. Well, he can't Indonesia. get to Neuholland, right? So that, he, that's too so far. But, but what is that? Why is that focus on Indonesia and, and, and Neuholland? I think I think it's, it's it's convenient insofar as you know he's able to show that he can because he can only step seven miles. He can step seven miles at a time. So some islands are off limits because you just fall into the sea. So it's just really for me. So Neuholland is 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 inaccessible. He can't get there because it's, it's, it's beyond the seven mile okay. limit, so he would just fall into the ocean. Oh, okay. um, and, and it just underscores the fact that this is now, a, it's still a brilliant technology to be able to walk seven miles at a step, right? So he's still embracing technology, but it does have its limits. We could still do, we could still have our devices, we could still have our programs, and we could still applaud medical technology and applaud all the great things that technology has done for world hunger and for inequality. And you know, we, we don't have to give it all up, Shimizo seems to be saying. And, and the fact that, you know, born into the nobility, he, he embraced the bourgeoisie, right? But he was still worried, right? That we're going to miss out on something if we don't allow those old ancien regime morals to limit. Because if, if the bourgeoisie have their day, it's, it's, we're going to end up destroying ourselves. I mean, and. We hear arguments like that all the time. You know, certainly we heard them in the Cold War, right? I mean, here, great, with 30,000 nuclear warheads, fantastic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with Germany smack in the middle between the Soviet Union and the United States. I'm going back to like, you know, 1983 now, but you know, th this, this idea that technology will one day be so autonomous mm -hmm. that humanity will no longer be necessary. Um, and in fact, things would work a lot better if there wasn't any human intervention. That's, that's our basic dystopia. Um, and you know, Shamiso seems to almost, so use your seven mile boots. You know, <coughs> feel great about how wonderful technology is to a point, right? And so I think that's why um, it's, it, and Indonesia is just, a, the, the archipelago just allows him to play with that. And, and of course he visited all, of, you know, he, we, his horizon are, are extensive. Um, and we have all of these reports um, so it's, it's also very prophetic. He d wasn't aware of this career in 1813, um, and yet, yes, it's absolutely yeah. remarkable. Yeah. And could I have two, two very short comments? Sure. So, so one was, what do you make of the fact that he says he was considered the Prussian prince? I mean, that he puts, oh, right, that, yeah. he puts that there. And the other thing that I wanted also to put in that context, what you mentioned with the Ancien Regime, the concept of the ridicule, mm -hmm. like this obsession yeah. of the ridicule, and it goes with your Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think that that would be interesting to explore. The, the Prussian, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, you know, the, the, the wars of liberation, of course, it's, it's a Prussian, it's a Prussian sort of baby. The, 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 I mean, it, the king of Prussia was responsible for the coalition, and, and, and it's basically the design of Prussia. So it might just be an allusion to the military prowess of it, to drive... I, th I, I, would, I, I don't know. As a critique or, as a, or is it just... It's hard to say. I mean, yeah. it, it seems like, because the Prussian prince would be, in a sense, reactionary, like pushing against the, the reforms of the, of, the, of the republic and the bourgeois class. So this would be, and, and the fact that he's nobility, I think it would probably be negative given the context, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, Michael, sorry. Hmm. You mentioned, of course, the, the, the etymology of Schlenio's name and you know, the presence of the Yiddish in his name. But I also wonder you know, to what extent we can see the story as a parable of um, you know, the, the Jewish parvenu in the 19th century, 19th century Europe uh, mm -hmm. striving for acceptance um, through a kind of assimilation, but always being rejected as being the outcast, as, as not belonging. And with, right. Um, there were a number of moments in the story where this kind of theme seemed um, very, very present. Um, when Shenyo is sort of lying in the hospital on this, this sick bed, he's become a, a gray man with a long beard. And, 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 and even, even sick, his yeah. uh, you know, travels around the world, although they are you know, enabled by you know, these wondrous seven league boots, it, he also appears. Um, a bit as the figure of the wandering Jew, right. who, who never finds a place that he can call his home, um, who's perpetually an outcast and who doesn't belong. Um, so I'm curious if you have thoughts about this this sort of context, or this, you know, the reading of this story as a parable in the sense that the parvenu becomes a pariah, he's marked by this kind of stigma of what he, but in this case, what, what he doesn't have, right? Mm -hmm. the, the absence of the shadow, uh, becomes a kind of metaphor for, you know, lacking, being able to completely integrate to completely assimilate. Yeah. Um, and, and then I'm also thinking in this regard about, uh, I, I really enjoyed your reading of the, of the boots, but, but what about the figure of the magic cap? Mm. Um, the time cap. The yeah. time cap that yeah. allows him to become invisible. And, and this is sort of a, a fantasy of, of, not of the accumulation of wealth, but of but of disappearing, of being completely invisible, um, you know, and of course, he, you know, he doesn't have a shadow if he's invisible, but at the same time, he's not marked as being the one who doesn't have a shadow. Right. So is there a kind of negative utopia? Um, you know, being invisible is a com complete <laughs> sense of lack, um, but it's one that, you know, it, it, it provides some kind of at least temporary resolution to this problem of always having to hide the fact that he doesn't have a shadow. Right, and he, of course he gets the, 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 the Todd Kappa from someone who still has a shadow. So he just sees a shadow running around until he's able to get the hat off him, the cap from him. I mean, the, it, it seems like a, an, an allusion to the Ring of Gyges as well, right? That this, which is also, I mean, invisibility is also a code or a key to, to incredible power, um, you know, that the invisible, um, is a source of great power. Um, and the idea that one can view uh, reality without being viewed in turn, that no one can see, um, like, like, like the acousmatic voice in film, right? It's, it's always more powerful when you can't identify the source of the sound, because when we can, what we can't see, just we imagine to be much more um, powerful because we, we can't even contain it with our own gaze. Um, so Shamil would be doubly powerful because he, he doesn't even have a shadow that would, at least, like the other poor man who lost the cap to him, has still had the shadow. So it might be a moment of, of pure limitlessness when he has the cap on. Um, and he's, but, so, but he's able, but you know, it's also, it, remind me, that it's at that moment that he witnesses Mina Engaging with Rascal, or is it just before that? I may be misremembering. 
Um, but but it's, it's a scene that, that undercuts that absolute power, I think. Um, and the, what, what, what happens, you have that very quick conversion from, from all power, omnipotence, to a kind of limitation um, where he cannot have any control over a world that he's transcendent to. So it's sort of this problem of transcendence. Um, but in terms of the, the, the pariah, the parvenu, I mean, this certainly seems like a, a right, the right kind of critique that Shamiso is poising, uh, putting here, whether, whether, he's, whether it's being done in a charitable way or an uncharitable way, I would, have to, I would have to think further on it. But I mean, he's explicitly said to resemble a Jew in, in the hospital at the end with the long beard. So it's not even, it's not even conjecture. So the fact that you know, the parvenu, the Jewish um, newcomer who can, thinks he could buy his way into society. And so you know, these are typical anti-Semitic charges of the time. And I, I, I can't imagine Shemiso is not trying to engage those. Yeah, yeah Kass. Um, yeah, I um, wanted to, to uh, come to something that Kass and that just continues to vex me. Um, it's this what, uh, when I read it um, even before this, I, it, it was strange. Mm -hmm. when, uh, just, when you quoted the preface and the comment on the solid, right? Mm -hmm. It is therefore the solid which is in question in the marvelous story of Schlemiel. Um, we would think it's about the shadow and the lack and not being able to get rid of that lack. But he keeps uh, talking about the importance of money, finance, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that he did not think of the solid. Yeah, it was as he knew, and he did not think of the solid. Mm -hmm. Think of the solid. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that seems to be not the moral of the story. Think of the shadow, right? Shouldn't that be the moral? But, but, right. Yeah. But, but you have no shadow without the solid. That's why right, he's yeah. Right, right, of course. Yeah. Right. But isn't the story also about the fact that the shadow isn't simply derivative of the solid, that it's not simply dependent on the solid, right? Right, it's able to be sold. Exactly, right. yeah. Which goes to Zvilat's fable, which I, which I knew, uh, that, that one can actually distinguish the shadow from the body. Right. Yeah. So I just wonder, but then the second question that somehow related to me is, so if in some sense capitalism is the togetherness of the overabundance or the idea of, of the anxiety of over the lack of lack mm -hmm. on one hand, but also the recognition of total loss on the other, mm -hmm. you know, and then the thing it says that quite clearly, it says, you know, well, I have to give up my hope, I yeah. have to resign. Yeah. Um, so if those two things uh, come together, um, there doesn't seem to be any um, balance or medium that would mediate. But in the idea of the Zimayan Schiefer, there is the handshoe that can somehow I mean, wear those pantoffles and so take it easier. Um, so I'm just thinking through the, those, those tropes that try to mediate, but kind of can't be. Really so you see it more as a failed. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there, the attempt you, you, you buy, the attempt, uh, but that ultimately it fails. Yeah, yeah it seems like that we, it, it, if there's too much or too little, yeah. then there's no... Because gray would be the color. Right. It's interesting that, that Shamil wears black and mm -hmm. Mina's in white. So we, we do have these two figures that don't come together, the black and the white. Um, so it, it would argue for maybe this, this idea of a distinction or, or failed mediation. Right. Yeah, nice. It's very helpful. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. I, I don't know your name. I apologize. I'm Bruce Duncan. OK, uh, hello. Um, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile the story of uh, Fanny's bleeding finger and then <laughs> yeah. uh, whether or not the question whether Schlemiel has any blood in his finger. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yes. mm -hmm. he won't sign. Are we to think that Fanny and that whole society that is the first image of a uh, inconvenient or a convenient society uh, 
have signed this document. Uh -huh. John has no shadow. I mean, has a shadow, so he has no soul. He has sense. no soul, right? What's, he with, looks like what's with her? <laughs> right. Uh, unnaturally uh, copious bleeding of her finger. Right. And, and, and would that somehow suggest that Shamil is bloodless? Well, the, yeah. the dead or the, the gray man suggests that he is, but yeah. he finds that he, he, he pokes his finger and he does he have does enough have blood it. to sign, but he doesn't he sign. sign. Yeah. She had plucked the rose or thorn, whatever yeah. and required a bandage. Right. Like excessive. To staunch the bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, they're, they're too similar not to be. Right. So, so, so how would that work? So Fanny is, is exemplifies a kind of excess, and Schlemiel exemplifies um, a dearth. Or I, I, yeah, well, yeah, a dearth. Or actually, no, he has. A but he has. He has sufficient to sign, but. But he chooses not to. Yeah. Right, but it is it is the bleeding of the finger, Fanny's finger, that that sets the plot in motion. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Because before that, it's just a garden party. I mean, it's really quite early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, within a page or two, uh, but that's obviously the event um, that that's, that that allows the man in gray to appear in the first place. Yeah, that last scene closes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Set in motion, but I'm still right. having trouble reconciling it. To yeah, the I would ha it's it's good. It, one would have to, I think. I, I would need to think it through. But thank you for that. Yeah. Never occurred to me, but that, that makes perfect sense. That that would be obviously pivots on that motif. Yeah. Uh, uh, Can I go for Jamie, and, then, and then Heidi, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, some of the comments, uh, the questions that have been circulating got me to thinking another thing um, about the, both the story and your presentation. And at the beginning, when you said you're situating convenience in relation to the overcoming of a limitation. Right. Um, but I'm wondering to what extent is that limitation specifically about necessity? Because uh, it does seem as though one of the things that Schlemiel laments is a kind of lack of necessity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's also this point about the solid. Right. So that the necessity, so necessity no longer has the function of limitation. Um, mm -hmm. So that what you have with convenience in the story is a combination of this luxuriousness and efficiency, hmm. just strange. That you right. don't normally think of, the, you think of those two normally as opposites. Right. Um, but there's a sort of principle of economy, of course, in convenience. You make things easier, bring things closer, you know, et cetera, move along the process of production. But also about the superfluousness and luxuriousness. Right. Uh, I find sort of interesting in the tale because of the, because it, it does, it, as well, just becomes this kind of empty signifier. It is completely luxurious. Right. Which is generally how we would take this story, right? I mean, even Aristotle, when he talks about currency mm -hmm. and, and the politics, right? That in this story, he'll bring up King, the King Midas legend. Mm -hmm. That gold, you know, gets you everything you want, but you can't eat it. You know, I mean, like the, you have all this gold, and, and you, know, you basically cannot satisfy the, the simplest want, because gold, Aristotle says, is nothing. It, it's nothing. It's just, it's just exchange power. And if you have a lot of it, right, it, the value um, is always in exchange alone and has no need value or no use value in Aristotle. And of course, you know, that, that will just continue to inform how we understand um, exchange economics and so forth. So, yeah, money yeah. creating money. And right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, and then this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, auto production of gold, right? I mean, a, a zecca also has a kind of testicular uh, connotation mm -hmm. to it as well, right? I mean, so you have this odd productive aspect, but what you're producing, of course, is just you're producing buying power, which in essence is nothing. It's, it's, not, it's nothing that you can't, you know, fill your stomach on buying power. You can buy food with it, but, but ultimately one has to draw the line. So, um, but I think that's where modern convenience differs from an, an older understanding of convenience as just satisfying bodily needs. 
that we're now at a place where it's not just satisfying bodily needs, but rather really overcoming limits. That matters more. And already the story anticipates that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's, that's why it's taken as a cautionary tale. Yeah. Oh, Heidi, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you. So I, I, you had mentioned it is a pseudo-autobiography, right. so I apologize. My first book was on biographical fiction, so I oh, am great. totally going down that road now. Fantastic. So the first thing, what is the shadow, what is the body? Mm -hmm. It is the doppelganger as well, like this yeah. whole mode is there. And it could go also to the to the hints that uh, Shamiso gives us in the story. He mentions in his letter to Shamiso, which is interesting, so it's not me, it's you. Um, you are sitting between the skeleton and the flowers, and I am here. So it's a little bit like the Werther. Uh -huh. Because very often Werther is read like, what if? Right. That would have happened to me if I had done that. What if I were you? So exactly, yeah. then we go to the Dichtung und Wahrheit. Right. And then um, with this uh, shadow, what do you want to say? I, I just think it's interesting to go down the road with Dichtung und Wahrheit. Werther, what is the role of Shamiso in there? Is he the shadow? Is he the one who did not sell his shadow mm -hmm. and remains in the shadow because it, he is in this little Biedermeyer room, <laughs> room <Right. laughs> with flowers? So I think that that would be interesting to see. Yeah. Well, there are there, there, those, those paratexts that were published in the 1814 edition, the, the, the letter um, Shamiso to Fouquet, Mm -hmm. Fouquet to Hitzig, right? So um, Shemiso says, you know, I'm sending this to you. Fouquet, you know, Hitzig is a publisher. He says, I'm sending this to you, but please don't publish it. I mean, this is, this is remarkable. You don't send a manuscript to a publisher and say, don't publish it. Um, and then Hitzig, Hitzig writes to Fouquet. Um, they're all there. And I, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a very ironic, very highly romantic um, ironic um, exchange of letters in, in a Hoffman-esque style as well. Um, it's like Hoffman's uh, letter to um, Fouquet when he, he apologizes that he will not be able to um, send the story as promised because, um, and, and then he says, oh, P.S., has it ever happened? You know, and, and, and the Rakrespel story is actually all in the postscript. That he, 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 he apologizes for not being able to write a story. And by the way, have you ever, does this, had this ever happened to you, you know, and so forth. So it's, it's almost a performative contradiction, but it's all very auto-fictional, I think. Um, and, and Hitzig, I think, is the one who says, well, the best way to make sure that people don't read this is to publish it. <laughs> it's like, it's like remarkable. So you, it, you could, one could have certainly a lot of fun with this. It's like Werther, you know, I insisting to Wilhelm, don't send me any books. Just bring, bring the Homer. Homer. <laughs> and so forth. Yeah, thank you. I think that's it, yes? Thank you so very much. That was very helpful and, and, and enjoyable. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>